Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. Good morning. This is Laura Smith on Blog Talk Radio. It is Saturday morning, uh, March 26, 6, 7 o'clock here in the morning, Calgary, Alberta. I'm glad to be here. Just having some coffee, waking up, and I uh, wanted to, to do a show on Saturday because I'm down to like two shows during the week uh, for, for this show. So this is One Child to Be Survivor to Another. We're on for 30 minutes. It's a live internet streaming radio broadcast from blogtalkradio.com. And uh, I didn't put the chat room up because I don't know who would be listening at this time. There's only a couple people on Blog Talk Radio right now, so... Um, most people catch my show on the archive, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna sort of get into what we were talking about for the last few weeks. And um, so yeah, I'm not a counselor or a therapist. I'm just a private citizen paying to do my shows, um, mainly to be one more voice speaking out against child abuse and speaking up, you know, for standing up for child rights and and um, also for survivors, just to be another voice out here for survivors of child abuse who may feel alone and. You know, no validation, not able to get any validation. And, and uh, so many people, I know myself, and so many people have been there and have been through that. So it's absolutely horrible. So I just want to be one more voice and uh, to raise awareness, you know. So you have to listen at your own discretion to all of my shows because I'm talking about abuse. And abuse is a sensitive subject and it's, you know, not something that a lot of people are comfortable listening to or even thinking about. So you have to know yourself what's good for you to listen to. Ultimately, you have to make that choice because it is up to you what you listen to. And so you have to be careful that information like this won't bother you and have to know what's okay for you to listen to and what's not. So it shows you have to listen at your own discretion. And I'm talking about abuse, and I don't sugarcoat it. I just tell it like it is. And um, so a lot of people may find it uncomfortable. I don't because I've had to live with this my whole life, and I don't mind talking about it. It took me down to the pits of hell, and... You know, I was ready to kill myself many times, uh, planning my suicides, and uh, was in, a, you know, a real bad place for many, many years. Um, and four years ago, I began my healing journey. But I've always, you know, I've, all, I've never had a problem talking about it because I, I had a real problem being abused, but I didn't really have a problem talking about it later. Um, so, but a lot of people might feel, you know, that the information is is uh, just upsetting and or just or just makes you uncomfortable on any of my shows. So you have to listen at your own discretion. And young people under the age of 18, you have to have permission to listen to my shows mainly because I believe children should be protected at all times and you should know, you know, how to protect yourself online and age appropriately. I don't know how young the people are who are listening to my shows, so I don't know, you know, if it's age appropriate for you and you know, if some who knows how how many young people are listening to my show. So you have to have someone listen to the show with you, a parent or caregiver, somebody who's older in your family that can help you make a decision whether you should be listening to my shows, any of my shows, right? And then they can help you make that decision whether you should be listening or not. And so we'll get right into this topic. Thanks, everybody, for being here. I appreciate everybody who's taken the time to tune into my shows. I've done over 600 shows, and yeah, that's a lot of shows to keep tuning into, and I appreciate it. This is my healing journey, the show in the morning, and... um you know, it, it helps me to work things through in my mind. It helps me to, you know, to sort of talk through stuff. It's, all, it's just this form of self self help, really. And but I wanted to to do this on Blog Talk Radio because I know so many survivors who have nobody to talk to, um, and just really don't feel comfortable talking to anybody about this stuff, but yet may feel some validation, you know, by by what I'm talking about and some of the material that I'm that I find helpful. This is why I do this. I'm looking at material all the time uh, regarding uh, adult survivor issues. And um, so I think that that uh, people can benefit from these, these this stuff as well. I know that I do. This particular website is called mudrashram.com. This is what we've been working on for the last few weeks. Dysfunctional families, that's what this was about. And um, it was written by George A. Boyd in 1992 from www.mudrashram.com, M-U-D-R-A-S-H-R-A-M, mudrashram.com. And um, we're quite a well, we're about three-quarters of the way through this article here, but it's a long, it's a long leg the article, but some really good information. And this is Mudrashram Institute of Spiritual Studies, when you grow up in a dysfunctional family. And so they're just taking a look, George A. Boyd's sort of talking about the different role-playing, the different types of roles that people will play in a dysfunctional family. The difference between a healthy family and a dysfunctional family, um, what happens to children who grow up in a dysfunctional family, and you know, healthy families, unhealthy families, um, boundaries, setting boundaries, a question of boundaries that we were talking about, and um, went through some exercises there. He's really written some good stuff here. Changing negative conditioning of the past, that's where we're at right now. 
and we'll just continue on with this this morning. So I'll just get scroll down to where I was here. Where we left off on uh, Thursday morning, metaprogramming is where we left off. And that's uh, metaprogramming, George A. Boyd says, means directing or changing your behavior and conditioning from an even deeper portion of you, called the metaconscious mind. Metaconscious mind brings the following functions to bear on your basic conditioning. So that's re- resolution, rehearsal, um, argument, planning, reflection, insight, self-awareness. So that's what he's talking about here. And we were looking at this for the last couple of days and looking at um, resolution, getting mad at, fed up with or tired of old behavior or habit patterns and deciding emotionally to do something about it. Rehearsal, role-playing, new verbal behavior, mentally practicing new movements, visualizing yourself acting in a new way, having new things and people in your life, and being a different person. Um, This is what he's talking about. Argument, setting new limits or standards for your behavior, specifying how your behavior, your words, or life shall be changed, and undermining and exposing your negative beliefs and behavior. And planning, that's where we left off. Scheduling, um, designing, and setting up new goal-oriented patterns of behavior, defining projects and goals, and specifying deadlines for accomplishment of objectives. Reflection, uh, think thinking about the consequences of your behavior, getting ideas for alternative ways of acting, feeling, believing, or thinking. So that's kind of where we left off. And, um, you know, reflection, thinking about the consequences of your behavior, getting ideas for alternative ways of acting, feeling, believing, or thinking. And I think, you know, regarding just dysfunctional families and abusive families, abusive homes, growing up in that type of a, of a home, you know, set really wasn't my fault that I picked up all these behaviors that were very negative and very damaging. Um, I was just learning and doing what my family was doing. You know, parents are their children's really number one teacher. So if you know if a child's gone bad, you kind of got to look where where the source came from. I, I I just don't you know there may be some once in a while a child who has emotional difficulties that have nothing to do with the parents or anyone else in the family, and it may be because of a chemical imbalance in their brain, or, or, you know, who knows what happens. Like, sometimes children do end up with this stuff, and they have perfectly good families. But a lot of times, you know, people like to say, well, look at that child, look how they're behaving, and what's the matter with them? And then, you know, they don't take a look at the parents. They don't take a look at what's going on within the family, within the dynamics of the home. And so many times people hide that stuff. You know, parents will act like they're, they will be one way when everybody's around, and then when nobody's around, they'll be themselves. Their real selves were like that. Like, they were able to go to people's homes, and they wouldn't, like, beat up on our neighbors. They wouldn't, like, they wouldn't curse at our neighbors and beat our neighbors up. Um, they were well-liked on uh, in the block that we lived on growing up. The, my parents were, even though the police were always there, they knew, people knew my parents were always fighting. Um, and people knew that there was problems within the home. They, my parents were able to be uh, a different side of themselves. Would come out when they were visiting their neighbors, like their friends, right? So their friends didn't get to see them, you know, being violent or, you know, they they knew they were arguing. They knew they had problems, right? But they never saw them beat on each other, um, trash the kids, trash the house. Uh, nobody, you know, because when my parents were out in, in amongst their friends. They wanted their friends to like them, so they would behave themselves, right? And as soon as they got home, it would all start again, right? The, their 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 real behavior, their, their real selves would come out. And the other part was just a part of them that they were able to, to be on the outside of the home. So, you know, many times people are like that, especially even with their kids, right? People will think, oh, what's wrong with the parents? They're great. It must be their children. And, you know, nobody really knows unless you had a video camera what's going on behind the scenes in somebody's home. And so many times parents will be like, oh, I don't know what's wrong with our son or our daughter, you know, or our children. We're such good parents and we love our children. But you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. You know, there could be a lot of psychological abuse. There could be a lot of emotional abuse, a lot of verbal abuse. Um, if you're not seeing signs of physical abuse, you know, there there could be sexual abuse even because a lot of signs of sexual abuse just aren't visible. And sometimes, you know, children look like they're failing within the home and then the parents look so good. And you got to kind of question that because children don't fail uh, within a, a loving, nurturing home. And if they do, it's because they have emotional difficulties, and you would know that because the child would be enrolled in a some type of a, of a special needs um, environment, right? There, there would be some help for that child, right? So that's why a lot of parents are very good at manipulating the system. And so, 
you know, reflection, thinking about the consequences of your behavior, getting ideas for alternative ways of, of acting, feeling, believing, or thinking. You know, it's not our fault that many times if you've grown up in a dysfunctional home or, or abusive home that we would take on these these bad negative roles and ways of thinking and ways of behaving. You know, I was just behaving the way my parents were behaving, right? But as a child, I didn't know how to turn it off. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't know how to be nice outside of my home. Um, like, my parents knew how to manipulate the system, right? So they knew how to do that because they had done it all their lives. So they taught us how to do that. You know, we were uh, told, like, we were quite often told that we were not going to tell anybody outside the home what was going on. And um, if we went to the neighbor's house, we had to be on our best behavior. And we were not allowed to misbehave, right? Now, most parents ter- tell their children that, but my, our parents were telling uh, telling us that because they had just beaten on us or just had a huge fight. And we'd all be crying and, ma- and a mess, you know, and, and uh, that we'd have to, like, pull ourselves together as a family to go over to somebody's house to have dinner. And then we just had a big old knockdown, blown out fight, you know, within the whole family because quite often that's what would happen. And, you know, our parents would tell us, you're going to put a smile on your face, you're going to behave yourself, you're going to straighten up. And, I mean, I used to get beaten in, in people's, in front of people's homes. My mother would slap me around, knock me to the ground, you know, punch me out um, because uh, she because I was still crying, right, because of the, their battle that they had previously to us going over to somebody's home. So, you know, it's not really our fault that we have. <laughs> We have these issues, you know what I mean? This was all given to me as a nice little packaged present from my parents, you know what I mean? And shame on them. Um, that's where the shame lies. That's where exactly where it lies. It lies on the abusers. It lies on those, <clears throat> you know, those people who would who would choose to bring up children and to, to treat children that way, right? That's where the shame lies. And so, you know, I don't have a problem with understanding who, who is at fault and who is to blame for that, you know what I mean? Um, they had every opportunity to get help. They had every opportunity to get us help, you know. And so, you know, thinking about the consequences of your behavior, getting ideas for alternative ways of acting, feeling, believing, or thinking, I had to do that as a teenager, especially as a teenager. Um, I started to see some positive stuff from people, like friends of mine whose parents were decent, right? Because I used to go, as, especially as a young teen, uh, hang around with some some of my friends whose parents were really nice and really decent people. Um, you know, they... You know, they seem just normal, you know. And the reason that it made such a difference, as far as I could tell, was because it was such an extreme from what was going on in my home. When I would go hang out at their house, you know, there there was no abuse. There was nobody beating on anybody. And, you know, sometimes there would be little arguments between the children and the, and the parents and stuff. But there was... It was the parents weren't cursing each other. They were actually talking to each other, and they were holding each other. My parents never touched each other except for in a in a in a harmful, violent way. My parents did not hug or hold hands, or um, I never saw my parents ever hug or hold each other or sit together on the couch. My parents were not in the same room at all together the whole time I grew up. So people want to know and understand, you know, what can cause a child to be so dysfunctional and have so many emotional behavioral problems. You know what I mean? Um, like, my parents never, they were just not a couple by the time I came around. Their marriage was in such shambles that, you know, they were not even able to be in the same room together without causing each other a lot of grief, you know, whether it was physical or or verbal or, you know, insults, physical violence, um, just just battering each other in whatever way they could, whether it was physically or verbally or emotionally, psychologically. <clears throat> so, I mean, this is what I witnessed. And so, you know, when I'd go to these other people's homes and these people would be like, you know, these parents would be like sitting there on the watching popcorn, watching a movie and holding hands or, you know, just saying nice things to each other. I was just like, wow, like, this is this is great. You know what I mean? Like, this is what life should be about, right? So I started to actually mimic and try to take on some of those people's behaviors instead of this other garbage that had been handed to me on a plate by my parents, you know. And this is this is, this is ridiculous, you know what I mean, that people, you know, I mean, I have a very small family left. Most of my family's dead and moved, gone, right? Um left this earth, right? And so I have family members now who have no concept of how dysfunctional that was. They think that was fine. They think that was okay. Um, they think there was nothing wrong with our parents' behavior, that my, that my dad would rape my mother, call her a whore and a slut and slap her around and, and beat on his kids, and that my mother would do what she did to all of us, right, which was to be abusive to every single one of us, and mainly me, because I was the the last child born, born out of rape, and a a convenient punching bag, you know what I mean? Um, There's people in my family that think their behavior was just fine, you know, 
and this is this is the sad part, right? Like, I mean, I decided that I wanted to not live like that, and I wanted to have a better set of ideas, and I wanted to have a better way of feeling, a better way of believing and thinking. I just didn't know how to do it. But at the age of 21, I mean, I stopped doing drugs, and I really started to try to focus on my, first of all, my career. I started to try, try to focus on doing something with myself. Um, so I stopped doing drugs, which was great. wasn't drinking alcohol or anything like that. Maybe once in a while having a drink, but, you know, staying sober. And um, and it took another 10 years, uh, and I was moving up to Canada at the age of uh, 29 because my, you know, to get away from my dysfunctional parents who were still very toxic and abusive and um, was still really planning my suicide. You know what I mean? Like when I moved to Canada, I was actually moving up here to plan my suicide because I wanted to get away from my family and stuff like that. So I was still extremely messed up. And, you know, working through through my 30s, just suffering along, I didn't start my healing journey until four, till, till 10 years later, 41 years old. And, you know, I wish I would have started my healing journey a lot, lot, lot sooner, a lot, lot, a long time ago, right? This is absolutely ridiculous that there's people in my family that think it's okay that what my parents did to each other was just fine. That's how dysfunctional they are. That is how messed up in the head they are because of what my parents did, right? And so that's why I'm doing these shows, and I hope they stay here for a very, very long time. You know what I mean? Like, you know, even if I leave this earth or whatever for for whatever reason, which won't be suicide because I've already made a, a commitment to myself four years ago that I am staying here as long as I can and do as much as I can to be a voice and, and uh, you know, to work with, with Dreamcatchers for Abused Children and to, to go, you know, national, to go worldwide and to, you know, really promote education and awareness regarding child abuse, you know, so I have no intentions on leaving before my appointed time. But, um, you know, and I'm glad I made that decision. Thank God I finally straightened up and decided to stick around and not let my parents win this fight. But, you know, there's, I, I hope these, these uh, shows stay here for a very, very long time and I hope that, People will realize the damage that's that's done uh, when they treat their children so extremely hor- horrible, you know, so extremely bad that and then get away with it. <laughs> you know, so many parents get away with abusing their children. You bet. My parents were brought up on charges and even had to go to court because of the abuse. Did they change their ways? No, they didn't change. They didn't care about the consequences of their behavior, right? They didn't want to get any new alter, all, new ways of thinking and acting and feeling. You know, they had no intentions on changing, changing their behavior, right? So it's really no wonder that my siblings, my two siblings that are left on the planet right now, would want to change their behavior, the way that they think and feel. They think it was fine that my dad battered my mother and raped her. Uh, you know, this makes me sick to my stomach every day I think about this because I know my, you know, my dad raped my mother in front of me when I was five, five years old, just turning six. You know, and I makes me sick to my stomach that my family would say that it was okay. You know what I mean? So I look at my sister and I cannot, as a matter of fact, I cut her off last August because I can't look at her anymore. I cannot look at somebody in the face who will not say that that was wrong. You know what I mean? Marital rape is wrong. It is. It's against the law, actually. And um, a woman has a right to her own body. And a child has a right to her to his or her own body. And even a man has a right to his own body. Believe it or not, women do actually, um, sadly enough, manipulate the situation and, and sexually abuse men too, right? right? People don't understand that, the dynamics of it. But I do because I've been in hell before and I've seen all kinds of garbage that people, you wouldn't believe, you know what I mean? Um, women do sexually use people, you know what I mean? Uh, a lot of people don't like to think about that, but they do. But the thing is, is that, you know, there's my sister, who would back up my abuser dad and not care that he raped my mother, not care that he call, that he would call her a whore and a slut, and that he would beat on his children because my brothers would always go to try to, as soon as my dad would be starting to attack my mother verbally or physically, you know, my dad would be in the house screaming at my mother, you're a whore, you're a harlot, you're a slut, and you've slept with everybody and none of these kids are mine, and blah, blah, blah. And my mom would be like, oh, shut up, and blah, blah, you know, and she'd be like, you know, sometimes crying, sometimes not. And then my brothers would get involved because my older brothers were quite a bit older than myself. They were teenagers at the time. And they would try to get my dad to stop his nonsense and try, you know, especially if he was starting to phys- get physically violent with my mother. And my brothers would get involved. And, of course, they'd be beaten on because my dad would beat on them and attack them. And, you know, and if I opened my mouth, I'd be slapped around or choked on the couch. I remember a couple of times I was choked on the couch, you know, and slapped around for opening my mouth, you know, to, to say something. There's my sister who sits by, five years older than me right now. She's just turning 51. 
And she has the nerve to sit there and say that it was okay for my dad to rape my mother and that it was okay for my dad to do what he did to all of us and that it was fine that my mother bashed my head with a rolling pin and that it was okay that my brother sexually abused me when I was eight years old. <laughs> you know, how, how dare she? I cut her off in August and I will never talk to her again. Uh, I decided that I don't have to hang around with people who will back up abusers and who will think that it's okay to abuse their wife, their children, whoever. Now, it's incredibly wrong and I don't, you know, I don't care who she is. I don't care if she's my sister or not. She she's she she condones abuse. And I don't hang around with people who condone abuse, especially that kind of abuse. We're not talking a slap across the face. We're not talking somebody just being a little bit upset with somebody. We're talking a man who raped his wife repeatedly for years and beat on his children, was brought up on charges continued to curse her, continued to treat her so bad. That's why my mother was basically just fighting back to save her life and um, became abusive herself. And she was abused as a child, too. So the whole thing was just ridiculous. And that my sister would sit there and back it up. She also would back up my grandmother, who killed her own son. Um, and, my, you know, my grandmother, who, you know, abused her own children, my mother and her all of her siblings and a bunch of orphans. And was not brought up on charges. This was back in, like, 1930, you know, or 1935, whatever. It's just absolutely ridiculous. You know, and, you know, this is the thing. This is the kind of people I have in my life. This, uh, that's why they're not in my life. This is, the, this is my family. Well, they're not my family anymore. I've disowned them. I've actually completely cut them all off because they will not come to me and say, Lori, we agree. It was wrong for Grandpa to rape Grandma. It was wrong for Dad to rape Mom. It was wrong for him to do all of that stuff. And uh, I'm glad that you're working through your healing journey. I mean, I don't feel, you know, whatever. If they don't feel they need to be on a healing journey, that's their own problem. But they don't have to condone the abuse. But to sit there and say it's okay, no, it's not okay. It never will be okay. And I don't hang around with people who think that stuff is okay. So I've cut my entire family off, you know, because they, they stick up for my dad. As a matter of fact, my dad phoned yesterday. I'm just griping here now because this is just makes me sick, that people will not change their behavior. They will not try to feel or act or think differently, you know, after and knowing that something is wrong. Something is completely wrong. You do not abuse your family and think that it's okay. And then the other family members stand around and say, oh, well, it's okay. No, it's not okay. And, you know, my dad is still just as sick as he ever was. He's borderline schizophrenic and he's he manipulates and plays people all the time. That's what he does. He's, he's a, you know, he's, he's schizophrenic, right? So he knows how to play people. So he calls me yesterday. I don't talk to him. I actually blocked his number yesterday because I finally got around to blocking his number. But he phones yesterday and he leaves me a message. We just love you and I want to see, I want to come over and visit. But he doesn't want to come over and visit. He wants to come over and pick up some mail that was here that's all just garbage anyway. And which I wanted to send to him, you know, in a package anyway, which is why I'm keeping it. Otherwise, I would have thrown it out. I was just going to send it to him when I got a big pile of it. And he says, we're just praying for you. We're all just praying for you. Oh, my God. What, my brother who doesn't believe in God? is not praying for me. I tell you that. My brother doesn't believe in anything, and he wouldn't say a prayer to save his life. Um, he's a totally non-Christian, and he doesn't believe in all that stuff. So my dad is just playing the situation. We're praying for you. We're, 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 you know, It's like, well, Dad, you caused me this hell. You were one of the people, besides Mom, who caused me to be this way and caused this hell in my, to, to me to grow up in hell and caused me to have a hell of a life afterwards. And now you're going to sit there and say you're praying for me? You know what I mean? But he's sick. He's mentally ill, and um, you know he's he's twisted. So it's like, oh my God, you know that's why I'm so glad that you know I, uh, that I'm doing what I'm doing because I see he would have got he would people would have just thought, oh what a lovely man, he's such a good man, you know. And that's the whole issue. Like I wanted people. There are people that do know the family that I hope they will tune into these shows <laughs> so they can get a real good clear picture of what he is, who he is, you know. Because to other people, he's great. See, my parents did not go around beating up on their friends, you know, or, or hurting their friends. They were very good to their friends, and they were, their friends were very good to them. But they were not good to each other, and they were not good to their children. And so, you know, this is, just makes me sick that abusers get away with doing what they do, even when they're brought up on charges, even when they should have been arrested. And this was back in, like, 1960. What, I said 62 the other day. It's 1967, because I was two years old. So 1967 is when my parents were finally brought up on charges. So the, so the, so they went to court and the, there was bruises. All, my brother had been beaten up, and uh, the children actually spoke up because my mother was trying to make it look like it was all my dad's fault, and my and the the older siblings, which were some of them were 
quite a bit older. My sister had already moved out of the house. She would have been 20 years old at the time. My other brother had moved out of the house. He would have been 18 years old at the time. But then there was some siblings there that were like 16, 14, you know, 12, um, this type of stuff, right? And um, my sister was five years older than me, so she would have been seven years old. So... And between her and my brother, there was five years, so that's 12. So there would have been you know, my sister, who was seven, my brother, Howard, who was 12, my brother, Rob, who was probably 15, who he was the one who was beaten up, my brother, Chess, who would have been 14, and and uh, my brother, Kevin, would have been 16 or 17, no, 18, but he would have just moved out. So, you know, older teens. So they told the judge. They said, no, our mother is beating on us, too. Our mother's just as abusive. And I'm so glad they spoke up because then both of my parents were brought up on charges. But they didn't put them in jail. They didn't arrest them. And we were allowed to stay in the home. Now, was that just stupid? But you know what, though? I don't blame the system. A lot of people like to point their fingers at the system. You know who I blame? I blame my parents. Because my parents were responsible. They were the ones responsible for that. So why would I want to blame the system? My parents had, had my parents were the ones who were abusing us, not the system. So it's important to... Remember where to lay the blame. You know what I mean? Um, and people say, well, if your parents didn't know better, the system should have done something about it. Well, back in those days, they didn't really have as much knowledge as they do now, and I'll tell you that. Back in the 60s, I mean, things were not not the same as they are today. I believe that we would have been removed from the home nowadays because there was five children still in the home, parents, two parents with mental illness, you know, abuse, rampant abuse, uh, domestic violence. You know, I think they would have got, they would have removed us from the home until our parents could prove that they could look after us, right? But the thing is, is that was back in 1960s. Nobody really cared. Abuse wasn't even talked about. Nobody even wanted to know about it. So, you know, this is the whole issue, right? I mean, it's just the times. But I'm going to blame who who really needs to be blamed and put the blame where it goes. And that's on my parents for not doing the right thing and getting us some help, you know? Yeah, and, and, and people would say, well, why didn't your older sister take you in? That would have been a nightmare. My older sister abused her own two children and her husband. She was a, she was a horrific mother. She was, she was just like my mother. She learned from the best. You know what I mean? My sister was exactly like my mother. You know, horrific. So, you know, I didn't want to even have much to do with my older oldest sister because she was abusive just like my mother. You know, why would I want to hang around with another abuser, right? She was always hitting me as well as her children. And make it a stay outside all day and drink from a hose and go to the bathroom down the street at the at the gas station because she wouldn't let us in the house, you know. So she was just another abuser, right? Just like my mother. So there you go. She learned from the best. That's what I'm saying. So you know, this is the whole issue, right? If we don't change the way, if we don't think about the consequences of our behavior, you know, and we don't find alter alternative ways of acting and feeling, believing, or thinking, nothing changes. Right, my my siblings are still going to be the same. It won't matter. They're still going to be the twisted, messed up people that they are, and with their belief system, thinking it's okay to rape people and hurt people, and it's just fine that our dad did all that and he's still living, and that that it's okay that he did all that. Oh, poor dad. Oh, poor dad. What, what what is going on with that? Not poor dad. Poor kids and poor mom. You know, my mother lies in a grave. You know what I mean? He didn't kill her, but he, I'd like to say that he really did uh, systematically over a period of 40-odd years as they were married. Systematically killed her, you know what I mean? And um, it just makes me sick to my stomach that, uh, that my dad, you know, there's three of my brothers lie in graves, right? And there's my dad. We're praying for you. You know, well, he's mentally ill. So, okay, I'm not, I'm not putting him down. What I'm saying is put the blame where it goes, you know? And he, this man had no no intentions of changing his behavior because he would never get any help for his mental illness. And the rest of my siblings, they don't they think there's nothing wrong with him raping my mother and calling her names and abusing the kids and abusing all of us and that my mother would have done the same thing, abusing us as well. They just think it's great. So I can't hang around with them because they have not changed their mind. They think it's, it's they they ta- they go against everything that I believe in, which is that no one should be abusing anyone, ever. And if somebody hurts somebody, they need to make it right. And they need to apologize. They need to say, look, okay, I screwed up. I, I'm sorry I hurt you. And I will change my ways. I will, you know, that's the whole consequences of our behavior. So we cannot take this on as adult survivors and think that it's okay to hurt people just because we were hurt or that it's okay to abuse people because it's not. We have to change the way that we, we, you know, the way that we feel and act and think if we want to really change our life. And we want to, we want to change the situation in our life. You know, is, is our behaviors have a whole lot to do with it. And the way that we feel, the way that we believe, the way that we think, you know. 
So we, this is really all about, it's about us. It's about how are we going to live the rest of our life, you know? Continue on in the same old dysfunction? Or are we going to work through some of this stuff or get some help, you know, get a counselor, therapist, whatever you got to do? Uh, but I would say just make sure that you do stick around and, and get some help and do not allow this, your past to destroy you, which is what I was doing, which I'm so glad I finally woke up and realized that that's what I was doing. It took me for a lot of cognitively probably 35 years to finally realize that, hey, I'm, I'm allowing this abuse to destroy me and i and I got to stop. I, gotta, I want to live. And I, I made the decision at the age of 41 that I wanted to live for real. And that I was not wanting to die, that I did not want to end my life. And that I wanted to live a good life, not a dysfunctional, sad, depressing life, a really good life, right? And I thought, okay, I can't rely on other people to do it for me, so I'm going to have to do it myself. And really, why should somebody else do it for us anyway? Who has that kind of time and energy? We, we, re- we are responsible for our lives. My parents were responsible for theirs. They just didn't do the right thing. And, uh, you know, we as the the children, the the offspring of abusers and dysfunctional people, abusive people, we we can't continue that role on, you know what I mean, if we want to have a good life. So we have to take a really good look at our behaviors and the way that we're behaving and what, and the way that we're thinking and feeling, you know, if we're going to ever change the way that we, the way that we are, because, you know, these behaviors are learned, right? And so we have to go back and undo this damage that was done to us so many years ago. But the thing is, is it's totally doable. But sometimes you might have to get help outside help, right? Counselor, therapist, whatever. Talk to a good friend or someone you trust, obviously. You know what I mean? Um, But whatever it is, make sure that you do get some help and don't allow yourself to be destroyed by this past abuse because we certainly didn't deserve it, you know? And we, we we can do this. Other people have done it. That's what I, I look to the examples who are in front of me, people who have, who survived the most horrific abuse. And, and I look at their lives and I think, wow, that's awesome. You know, they're doing so good. And it's a real it's a real nice um, example for me to follow, right? So that's what I do. And so, you know, I would just say get some help, whatever way it is. If you can't cope, you call a crisis line, but you call somebody. If you can't find somebody to talk to because there's nobody around, you phone a crisis line. That's what those people are doing. That would be somebody like myself sitting on the end of the crisis line. And the reason I'd be doing it is because I, because I care about people. You know what I mean? There, there would be no other reason why I would be doing that. Who would be sitting on the other side of a crisis line if they really didn't care? People have better things to do, and there's better jobs out there, uh, a whole lot better paying jobs and better jobs, right? People who do that are doing that because they care. They may have lost a family member. They may have lost. A, they may have tried to kill themselves before. They may have had all kind, you know, seen all kinds of stuff. And who knows for whatever reason they're doing that? But those people are there because they care. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. There's way too many better things to be doing than sitting on the line on the end of a, a crisis line. So you know, you make sure if you can't cope, you phone a crisis line. You phone somebody. You know what I mean? And you make sure that you get some help and stick around because I'm glad I made the decision to stay here. I'm glad I made the decision to fight this thing and, and you know, and, and get well and be happy and, you know, learn to get through the bad days, you know, which is what I'm doing and um, learn to um, allow myself to heal, right, and to love myself and to enjoy this life, right? So I certainly didn't enjoy the first uh, 41 years of it, but I'm starting to enjoy it now. So that for real, my on my own terms. You know what I mean? Um, finding out who I am, you know, what I'm made of and what I can do. And so, you know, I'm so glad I decided to stick around. You know, it's, it's, I'm so glad because, you know what, it allows me to win this fight. And that's what I hope everybody else will do. Because if I would have, if I would have actually gone through you know, with my su- planning my suicide and actually followed through with it, I would let my parents win. And my dad would have been like, oh, well, my children were just so messed up, you know. And that's what he said about my brothers, of course, who killed themselves not take any responsibility for, for his, the way that he treated them. And so, you know, that's what my family would have done too had I kicked, had I done that and actually, you know, committed suicide or whatever. My family would have been like, yeah, she was just so screwed up in the head anyway because that's how my family is. They, they, don't, they don't care, right? So my parents would have won this fight, see? But I'm so glad I stuck around and I finally figured it out. I'm winning this fight. My parents lose. I win. And my, you know, yeah, it's a good it for sure because it's a slap in the face to them uh, because they couldn't destroy me they couldn't kill me and I think that's great I laugh every day because of that I'm like ha ha because you know what they tried they really did their best so I mean and when you have people working that hard to kill you and destroy you I mean you know this was a pretty tough fight and so I'm I feel pretty good about being able to say that I'm that I'm victorious in this you know because they really did try to kill us in, the, in every way right and so that's why 
three of my siblings or well, two anyway are dead because they were committed suicide, right? Um, and one was murdered, so we can't count that. Except for I thought that my there was some involvement from my dad in that, but I'm not. You know, the FBI couldn't prove it, so what are you going to do? And um, you know, so hey, they tried to kill us, and you know what? I win this fight because I stick around and I'm gonna have a good life. So I hope that you will do that too. Have a great day, everybody, and I'll be back on later on, as well as on uh, tomorrow, and then next week you can check my show schedule as well. I'm going back to my regular schedule. Um, I'm thinking next week. I was going to wait till April, but I think I'm going to go back next week because I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, I was just a little bit overtired, and I needed to take a couple weeks to sort of take a, a break for a couple of weeks. So have a great day, everybody. Take good care of yourselves. Bye-bye.